Um, I don't know if, if you heard about the social media trend. I've always got my finger on the pulse of social media trends, you know, so I don't know if you heard about the social media trend that was a few months ago, um, which is that's normally when I pick up on things, but uh, there was this trend of wives videoing their husbands and asking them uh, how often they think about the Roman Empire. And they, you know, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't prep them for this question, um, but they would ask them this question. And it was a shockingly high number of them responded every single day, <laughs> like unprovoked, just, yeah, sure, I think about the Roman Empire. And even those who didn't think about it every day were every week or two. It was a part of their uh, mental <laughs> lives. Now, I wanted to shore up those statistics in my own life, and so I'm listening to an audiobook right now about the Roman Empire, because <laughs> as one should, right? Um, and just this week, that book about the empire was describing uh, the siege, the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So, you know, about 30, 35 years after Christ dies on the cross, um, the temple is still standing in Jerusalem, and uh, all, there's all this background that leads into this, but essentially um, the new emperor's son, Titus, just comes in, sieges Jerusalem for several weeks, and it's really bad, and ultimately just flattens the city and destroys the temple uh, in a massive show of, of force um, of the Roman Empire, of the power of the Roman Empire. So it's fascinating to listen to this. But in the background to that and in explaining how all of that came about, the author spent a lot of time describing the Jews, the Israelites, and how they were perceived by the culture around them. It was really interesting to listen to that. And what he said was they were unique among all the peoples in the Roman Empire. Of course, Rome conquered all of these different cultures, all of these, all of these different people groups, but the, the Judeans or the Jews were very different than anyone else. And they were perceived as strange by certainly the Romans, but by others in the culture around them. I mean, they had these odd practices. They practiced circumcision, which was very unusual. Uh, they wouldn't eat pork. You know, they would avoid certain foods, which was odd to the Romans. And the biggest thing with the Jews that separated them from any other culture was that they worshiped one God and they believed he was the creator God and the only true God. Of course, in, at that time, almost everybody worshiped a whole pantheon of gods. It was a part of their culture, an important part of their culture. But monotheism, the Jews worshiping one God, made them outliers during that day. And so they were seen as strange and unique and their culture was, was very different. There was a certain amount of distance between their culture and the culture around them. Now, that distance between cultures, you can see that continue in the early church. It continues in some ways, but it's also a little bit unique because, see, with the Jews, they had a, a, a homeland. They had an area that they primarily lived in, and they had a temple, and they had a, a, a government that was essentially, it had been theirs, and that they you know, still wanted to operate under if they could. But the early Christians never had a homeland. And so what would happen in the early church is they would spread out all over the world, all over the Roman Empire of that time and, and beyond, and they would adapt their lives to the culture that they lived in, in some ways. And in other ways, they would have to, in order to be faithful to Christ, they would have to maintain... You can see the title today, A Necessary Distance from That Culture. And Christianity is unique in that way of any faith or any religion in the world. Christianity adapts itself to, in some ways to the culture in which it lives and resides and also at the same time maintains distance from that culture. If you travel with me to Nepal, you will meet Christians who are the same in many ways, but who also practice a version of Christianity that is different and it's unique and it would, their church services are quite different than our church services. But the core is the same gospel Christianity. So there's an adaptation to culture and there's a, 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 an attempt to avoid assimilating to the culture. 
And that's what Christians have tried to balance and maintain that tension throughout the history of the church. And we find ourselves in that exact same situation today. We have to be faithfully present in the culture. You all dress like the culture around you to some extent, but there are other ways in which we maintain distance from the culture. And our passage today is going to emphasize the distance part of of, uh, that tension. And he's going to teach us how to maintain and in what areas we should maintain that distance. So 1 Peter 4, verses 1 to 6, you can see the the title on the screen, Necessary Distance. Here's what we're going to look at today in this passage. Four responses, you'll see why I say responses, to Christ's suffering that create distance from the culture. So this is how we are to be unique. This is how we are to be different, faithfully present, and yet faithful to be unique. The first one of these responses is we choose suffering over sin. This is found in verse 1. Look at the first phrase of 1 Peter 4 and verse 1 with me. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh. So obviously you can see the word therefore. He's connecting this back to what he's just said. And this is really a summary of what we saw in chapter 3, verses 18 to 22, which is what we looked at last week. Look back to verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So Christ suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. What did we learn ultimately about his suffering? What did it lead to? Well, in that text, if you look down at verse 22, here's the end goal. Who, this is talking about Christ, has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Ultimately, his suffering for sin led to authority, exaltation, and glory. He submitted to suffering for us in order to bring us to God to recreate that relationship that humanity had lost with God. And through his suffering, he's been exalted to the highest place at God's right hand. So now, after explaining that narrative of Christ's suffering in verses 18 to 22, now in chapter 4, verse 1, he's going to move to some practical application. So he says, since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, since What I explained to you in verses 18 to 22 is true. Here are some practical results of that and responses of that that should be in your life because of what Christ has done. Look at the next phrase in verse 1 of chapter 4. Since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So to arm yourself, probably to you, sounds like a military term. And it is a military term. He's saying you are to get ready. You are to equip yourself, prepare yourself. This is something you are doing in advance of what's coming. But what exactly are we to equip ourselves with? With the same mindset as Christ, the same mentality, the same way of thinking, the same disposition or outlook that Christ had and exhibited when he suffered. Well, what mentality was that? What was behind Christ's willingness to suffer? He was willing to undergo unjust suffering because he knew what the end goal was. He knew that this was not permanent. He knew what was coming his way. And so Peter is saying, look to the example of Christ, understand what happened to him, and ready yourselves to suffer unjustly if that is necessary. If that's what's required of you, you want to be prepared for that, just like Christ was. And so what he's saying here is there, there, it's a call for a certain amount of grit, a certain amount of determination, a certain amount of preparation in your Christian life. It's looking ahead at what could come in your life, has the potential to be there, and mentally 
emotionally and spiritually preparing yourself for that. Now, when you think about some of those words I just used, determination, grit, even the, the military equipping and preparation, I think sometimes in, when we think about all of that, there's a little bit of a tension that comes in for us. And so I think we want to, as, as good Protestants, we want to desperately avoid anything that sniffs of works righteousness. We know we can't earn favor with God, and so we don't want to go down that road of thinking that if I just work hard enough, then I can get in God's good graces. And that's not what Peter is saying here, and we certainly want to avoid that mentality. But avoiding that mentality doesn't mean that we throw discipline and throw intensity and determination about our preparation in our faith out the window. Peter uses military language here intentionally. And there are other places in the New Testament where other authors use pretty intense metaphors to talk about how you and I should go at our Christian lives and our, our response to Christ and what he's done for us, our pursuit of him. I mean, listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. If you've ever tried to run or prepare yourself for any sporting event, you understand just how much discipline and work that takes to get ready for that. And Paul just assumes that this is how we're all going to go about our Christian lives and our pursuit of the Lord and our preparation for potentially suffering for our faith one day. This is what you do. This is how you go about it in Paul's mind. It's like a runner disciplining himself so that he or she can be ready to run the race well and potentially win the race. One of America's greatest theologians lived in the 1700s, Jonathan Edwards, when he was a very young man, wrote a list of 70 resolutions. And in this list, he, he enumerated all of these uh, resolutions and pursuits that he was going to have in his life in order to go after Christ hard, to keep himself on task. He did not want to waste his life and waste his time. And so he put these things in order in his life and said, I'm going to review these every single week so that I can keep myself on task and preparing and going after the Lord. Every one of these 70 resolutions begins with the word resolved. So it's quite a read if you end up going through all of them. I'm going to give you a couple of them this morning just to give you a taste and an example of how passionate he was about going hard after the Lord and structuring his life in a way that prepared for whatever the Lord had for him. So here's a couple of them. First one. Resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to God's glory and my own good, profit, and pleasure in the whole of my duration without any consideration of the time, whether now or never so many myriads of ages hence. Resolve to do whatever I think to be my duty and most for the good and advantage of mankind in general. Resolve to do this, whatever difficulties I meet with, how many and how, how great soever. He's going after it. I love this one. Number six, resolve to live with all my might while I do live. Number 22, resolved to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world. So he's preparing for eternity as I possibly can with all the power, might, vigor, and vehemence, yea, violence, I am capable of or can bring myself to exert in any way that can be thought of. 
And this is a guy who understood what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 9 and understood what Peter was saying here, to take on the mentality of Christ with some grit and some determination. Now, why does Peter want us to put this same tenacious mentality on? Look at the end of verse 1. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, and here's why. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So here's what this is not saying. Peter is not saying to make things really, really difficult in your life by pursuing suffering. Because as long as you suffer, that's the key to stop sinning. That's not what Peter is saying here. He's not saying that you should make a whip and lash your back like certain Christians and others have done over the years. He's not saying that you need to sleep on a concrete floor just so life is really, really hard for you. Because if you do that, then you'll stop sinning. That's not what he's arguing here. But what he is saying is that when you have the same willing commitment as Christ to suffer, when you have that mentality, when you have prepared yourself for whatever comes your way spiritually, when you follow through with that, when you're willing to accept insults and injury and persecution from the world around you, then you show that sin's dominating power has been broken in your life. You choose suffering over sin, which is our first response here. You show that there's distance between you and the culture, that you're not just going to get carried along with the culture, that you're willing to prepare yourself to suffer and to make a stand where you need to, and you're not swayed by persecution and by insults, and you're prepared and you're ready. And when that happens, it shows not that you'll never sin again, but that the stranglehold that sin has in people's lives has been broken for you. And that you're committed to a new way of life. One author said it this way, the commitment to suffer reveals a passion for a new way of life. When you reach this point where you're willing to suffer, it shows that you're serious about Christ and your pursuit of him. And that new way of life that you're committed to, that is what creates even more distance between you and the culture around you. And this is our, our second response. Change your ruler. So choose suffering over sin. And then as you see Christ suffering and prepare for potential suffering in your own life, when you're committed to this and his way of thinking, then you change who has control in your life. You change who is your master or who is your ruler. And the question here is, as you get into verses 2 through 4, how will you spend the rest of your time on this earth? That's the question that is the headliner over verses two through four. What are you going to do? What am I going to do with whatever amount of time I have left on this earth? Peter says, when you take on the same mindset as Christ, when you're prepared to suffer for your faith and sin no longer has dominion over you, then you're going to live by the will of God. You're gonna let God's will dictate how you spend the rest of your time on earth and you're not going to let human passions, normal, unbelieving human desires control you. Look at verse 2. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Human passions, what he's describing here, are just those desires that define unbelievers. They're the desires that characterize regular, cursed by sin, born into sin, humans apart from God's influence. It's what normal people want to do and do with their lives. It's what they love. It's what they pursue. It's what they go after. Peter says here that if you take on the mentality of Christ, you'll no longer live for those passions. Instead, you will live and be ruled by the will of God. Look at verse 3. It continues, for 
It's an explanation of living that way, this new way of life. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. That's another way the Gentiles want to do of describing human passions. I love the word want there. It's what their hearts are attracted to and drawn to. It's, it's how they want to spend their lives. And so in this, these, these verses, Peter is dividing our lives into two time periods. And he's dividing our lives into two possible commitments. Okay? You have a time period before Christ in your life. And there is a way of life that characterizes life before Christ. And it's defined by sinful human desires. Or you can have life after Christ with the mentality that Christ has. And that way of life is determined by God's will. There's two time periods, two commitments, two ways of living. You can see this in 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me read a couple of verses to you. Verses 14 and 15. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Right? It's when you didn't know God, these desires controlled and consumed you. Verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. It's not how you used to live and how you used to be and what you used to want. Now there's a whole new way of life for you if you are in Christ. So what's the way of life that is characteristic of those apart from Christ? Well, verse 3, the rest of verse 3, gives you some of these vices that dominate life before Christ. Look in verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Now, I probably don't need to go into detail of what all of these are. I think you have a pretty good idea of what some of them entail here. But if you put all of these together, these vices that are listed, these practices here, what's the common element that ties them together that is characteristic of life apart from Christ? All of these picture a life that is lacking in control, in self-control. They picture a life that is carried along by whatever desires happen to strike that life at the moment. Oh, this sounds fun. I'll go do this. I'll pursue these sinful passions. It also, they present a life that is carried along, not just by individual desires, but by the culture and the passions and the drives of the culture that we are embedded in. So here's what's true of you as an individual here this morning and every person that is born into this world, okay? You are an individual, and our culture stresses that, that you are an individual. So you have your own unique goals, your unique desires, your passions. That's all true of you, but you don't live life in isolation from other people and from a culture, you are born into a particular time period and a particular way of life. And that culture shapes you and forms you. And it encourages certain passions and desires and loves in you. And most of the time, we don't even recognize that that's happening. That is what we call the world. That's what 1 John's talking about. Don't love the world. It's that whole system that encourages a certain way of living certain passions and desires. All of us, to some extent, are the product of our time and place. You love certain things because you're an American born here during this time period. And if you, even with the same genetics and, and constitution, were born in the 1600s in Africa, you would love different things because of the culture and the time period that you are embedded in. We're shaped often and all the time by that system and by that culture. So both of those are true at the same time. But when you come to Christ, there is a decisive break with what you love as an individual, and there should be a decisive break as well with the passions and the desires of the culture 
that you're embedded in. The way of life of the world around you needs to have some distance for you. You have to start perceiving, oh, this is what the culture is encouraging, this way of life, this passion, this love. I need to make a break with that in my own life. Notice what Peter says in verse 3. I love this uh, little gentle sarcasm that he has here, right? For the time that is past suffices. He says the time is sufficient. Of course the time is sufficient for you to have lived in this way. You've been pursuing, when you were an unbeliever, all of this way of life that is characterized by human passions, and that's enough. You've given enough to that way of life. So don't give any more of your time to it. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? Don't give it to this. Don't let it be characterized by the culture around you, by these unbridled and worldly passions. Don't love power in the same way. Comfort, food, sex, money. Don't let those desires control you like they did when you were an unbeliever. And when this happens... When you see the distance and then live into that distance with the culture around you, then this this is what happens in verse 4. Look there with me. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. It makes sense here, I think, that Peter calls this way of life a flood of debauchery. Sort of this lack of constraint and self-control, but he describes it as a flood. So he's saying here, don't get carried along in the current of the culture. Don't be in it. Now verse 4, the people here, the unbelievers around these Christians, are surprised and frustrated with the Christians because they're not participating in all of these activities in verse 3. And if you put all of these activities in verse 3 together, they would have described religious functions that people were participating in. So during this time period, the worship of idols was very common. This is what everybody did because there were a whole bunch of gods that you had to worship and appease. And so they would worship the pantheon of gods by making idols, and they would go to these massive festivals that involved drunkenness and sexual promiscuity. Everything listed in verse 3 was a part of these religious festivals that they would hold. And it wasn't just that this religion was sort of what you practiced on your own time in your private life over here. During this time period, worship of the gods involving all of these activities in verse 3 was necessary for the unity of the state, of the government, of the culture. And so if you rejected this, then you could potentially be the problem and why there wouldn't be as good of a harvest this year and why there may not be enough food or why there may be some natural disaster. If you didn't participate and worship the gods as everyone else did, then you could potentially be the problem for the culture. And so people would see that and would see that these Christians, there was some distance there. And look at the end of verse 4. This is what would happen. They malign you. Led to frustration. Come on, man. You got to come participate so that the gods will bless us this year in the harvest. And so they would hurl insults and mockery at these Christians. And this sort of response is something we've come to expect in the book of 1 Peter, right? And we've seen this all over the place. Distance creates distrust from those in the culture. I mean, look ahead in chapter 4. We'll see uh, some of these verses in the coming weeks, but look at verse 12 of of chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Look down in verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So he's saying if there's distance, at times you, you may have to expect this. But I think the exhortation at the end of verse 19 is so important for us to remember to entrust our souls to God And that leads us into our third response of verse 5, 
of chapter 4. So as you participate in this new way of life and you change who your master and your ruler is and you're not dominated by these sinful passions, then you receive potentially insults and mockery because of the distance that's there. Verse 5 strengthens us to continue to maintain that different way of life. Look at verse 5. But they, those who malign you, will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So think about the situation of the Christians in Peter's day. They are by far the minority in their culture. We just talked about they didn't participate in these Roman activities. And so because of that, they were viewed with suspicion by their neighbors, by friends, and potentially by family members. And if you're a Christian in that situation, no doubt there were moments when it seemed like the unbelievers around you were enjoying the favor of the gods, right? Their perspective, their worship of these gods seems to be blessing them in this life. Their lives look interesting and enjoyable. They seem to be having a good time. They had social capital. They were part of the majority. And when you're a part of the majority, that normalizes what you're practicing and what you're doing. I remember one time in Virginia, um, when we were living there before we moved to Michigan, I was telling my friend Rich, uh, who worked with us in our, our ministry there at the church and college ministry, I was telling him that um, there were Sunday mornings uh, particularly in the summer when the humidity was just through the roof and I was getting up to put a suit on to go to church. And I would get up on Sunday morning and be going out to head to church early and I'd be tired from the week and we'd go out the door and I'd see my neighbor there with his coffee, hanging out with his kids in the yard. And I thought, oh man, I was a little bit envious of him in those moments. That looks great to some extent. And, you know, Rich had a nice, kind talk with me about that mentality. It was very helpful. But I have no doubt that there are times when it seems like we are the outsiders and it's more difficult. And like those outside of the faith are really the ones who are enjoying the good life. They're doing things well. They're the insiders. And yet, Peter says, when that happens here, you have to look ahead to the future. And that's what he's talking about in verse 5. But they will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. There will come a point when each person will face God's just judgment. Each person will give an account for how they lived and what they did with the knowledge of God and Christ. Romans 1 says that we are all responsible to God. Because even through creation, we are able to perceive that there is a God, one true God. We're responsible because Romans 2 says that the law is written on our hearts. We have a moral conscience. And yes, it's twisted by sin. And, and yes, it often doesn't function properly. But we are, even in our unbelieving state, aware that there are some things that are right and there are some ways of life and actions that are wrong. Why would that be the case? Why would we have that moral conscience if there were not a God who had set that in place? And Romans 1 and 2 argue that people have rejected that knowledge of God and they are accountable for that. They are under the wrath of God for that rejection. And here, Peter says to keep all of this in mind, that judgment is coming. They will give an account. And he says here that they will give an account for the way they've treated you, for the insults and for the mockery. And that's why I say here, count on vindication. It's not just count on judgment. It's to actually look ahead and count on vindication. Know that God is going to set things right. And he's going to bring judgment and this will give you the resolve and the strength to endure. 1 Peter 2, verse 23, this is the same mentality that Christ had. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him 
who judges justly. Next week in 1 Peter 4, in verses 7 through 11, he's going to look ahead to the end times, and that will, that anticipation and hope will form the basis for our actions now. Look at verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Peter's constantly telling us in this epistle the way to live faithfully present, to live a new way of life, even when it's hard, to have distance from the culture and be able to engage the culture with the gospel. The way to do all of that is to look ahead to the future, to understand what is coming. Know that your ultimate vindication is coming, so keep the faith now. And Peter knows that that is coming because of Christ's victory that he talked about in verses 18 to 22 of chapter 3. And that's what he goes back to here in this most unusual verse, in verse 6. Here's what he's saying. Connect your life to Christ's victory. This is part of your response to Christ's suffering and exaltation is to connect your life once again to what he has done. So this, verse 6, let me read it to you. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So this takes us back, I think, to verse 19 of chapter 3, where Christ dies, and on Saturday, between his death and his resurrection, he goes to the realm of the dead. And in verse 19 of chapter 3, he proclaims his victory to these spirits who are kept in prison. So that happens in verse 19. What we're talking about here in verse 6 happens during the same time period, I think, but it's to a different group of people. And I think it's a different group of people because different words are used. It says the gospel was preached. The word preached is good news, to proclaim the good news. And obviously the word gospel is the word good news. And so I think what's happening here is it's Christ proclaiming victory to the Old Testament saints who were there in the realm of the dead between his death and resurrection. So he's not offering salvation here. He's going and he's proclaiming the good news and saying, I've won the victory. And I'm here to tell you that I've won the victory. This is an affirmation of what they already have in him. Now, why would this obscure truth be an encouragement to you and to me? Well, I think the next phrase of verse 6 has a lot to do with that. Look there. For this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead, proclaiming the victory of Christ, that though judged in the flesh the way people are. So what's this talking about? I think it's talking about what happens in verse 5. Unbelievers maligning you for your faith. You are judged in the flesh the way people are. That's often how it happens for Christians. So you're judged in the flesh the way people are, but because Christ proclaimed his victory over sin and death in that moment and then won the victory, then the end of verse 6 is true of us, that they might live in the Spirit the way God does. So he's saying even if you're judged in this life in the flesh because Christ has already won the victory and proclaimed that victory, you can be confident that your ultimate vindication will come. Now, of course, when Christ entered into death and proclaimed this victory to the Old Testament saints, what happened? He took them out with him. And now they are in the presence of God. And that's where you and I will go after the moment of death. And I think that's a beautiful picture to see Christ proclaiming his victory and then with him in his resurrection, those saints' souls going with him into the presence of the Lord, including Adam and Eve, Abraham, all of them, with him in his victory, awaiting the final resurrection of the body where things will be as they should be. That is our hope and our comfort. And that's what he's saying here in verse 6. And that ex expectation is how you and I can endure in the middle of difficult times. So, with that said, let me zoom back out here and fit some of these passages together as we finish up this morning, all right? So let's start in chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. In that, chap in that section, we were encouraged to proclaim the gospel boldly and gently. 
as we give a reason for the, the hope that's in us. So we're to live in close contact with those in the culture so that we can share the gospel as opportunity comes up. In verses 18 to 22, we have hope in suffering because Christ's suffering led to glory as his work benefits us. And then in chapter 4 here, Peter turns to practical application. And he says that Christ's suffering leads to a new way of life for us, one of cultural distance in our desires and in our actions. And so throughout this whole passage, you can see this faithful presence. We're close enough to preach the gospel, but we're distant enough in our desires and our actions that there's a difference there. And we can continue to live this way with this tension amid opposition because of what is coming in the future. Because of what Christ has won in the past, because of what we're going to experience in the future. And so live with the necessary distance in the right way so that you can maintain your witness. And live with the necessary adaptation to the culture and being in the culture and with people so that you can proclaim the gospel. Continue to do what is good. Continue to speak the truth with clarity and boldness so that others can become a participant in what Christ has accomplished on the cross, in his resurrection, and in his exaltation. Let's pray.